Why did NHS management fail to act sooner, despite repeated warnings from doctors on the ward? There have been opportunities for those people who are at the top of the Countess of Chester to be able to put their hands up and admit that they got it wrong. And this is what's incensed me more than anything. They are still trying to find reasons why what they did was the right thing. You know, for example, one of them said, oh, well, we weren't loud enough in expressing our concerns. How much louder could we be? We were loud enough for you to try and vilify us and smear us and drive some of us to the point of applying for jobs in other hospitals. Josh Halliday, you were in court reporting on Lucy Letby's trial for the last nine months. What happened at her sentencing last week? Every sentencing starts with the prosecution outlining what the range of sentencing looks like for the crimes that person has been convicted of. And for this, there was only one option, which was a whole life order, which is an incredibly rare punishment, and it means that the defendant is never released from prison. Barristers for the defendants usually offer mitigation to try and reduce that sentence, but in this case, there was nothing that Lucy Letby's barrister could say to try and reduce that sentence. There is nothing more serious than murdering babies, murdering multiple babies, murdering babies in, in the way that she did, the abuse of power. And it was a whole life order for each of Letby's victims. Letby did refuse to attend her sentencing, which infuriated a lot of people around the country. It just seemed like another cruel twist to what has already been an unbearably bleak story. Josh, what was the mood like in the courtroom when it was clear that Letby wouldn't be back? There wasn't a palpable outrage in court. The parents of Letby's victims had stayed utterly dignified throughout this whole nine-month trial. But outside court, when we could finally reveal that Letby had refused to be in court, there was absolute outrage. I mean, that people can refuse to be present to hear their punishment. It's the third time in, I think, in less than a year when someone convicted of murder has refused to be back in court to hear their sentence. The Justice Secretary has has said that they're going to push through this new law to compel defendants to be present. But in court during the sentencing, it, it felt incredibly powerful that these victim impact statements were being read by parents to an empty dock. You know, they were written, addressed to Lucy Letby. The jury deliberated for over three weeks. What made the case so complicated? First of all, each of these babies were premature. In fact, all but one of these babies were born premature. Some had other vulnerabilities, and that complicated the investigation because police had to prove that they hadn't collapsed or died for for natural reasons or because of their extreme prematurity. Some of these babies were 12, 15 weeks premature, which is what doctors call the margins of viability. You know, one of the babies was given a 5% chance of survival. So proving that someone had deliberately harmed them was very, very tricky from the very beginning. The other reason why it was so tricky is because a lot of this evidence is medically contested and under-researched. So all of this evidence was incredibly medically complex. The jurors were given a 25-page medical glossary. Some of the medical notes for for the babies ran to five to 8,000 pages just for one of these victims. And so because there were 17 babies in the trial, uh, it was a huge, huge volume of evidence and it was really difficult to understand what the jury were making of it because it was so highly complex. I guess it's made especially difficult because these weren't murders as we think of them in the typical sense. It was a very different clinical kind of violence that Lucy Letby inflicted on these babies and it wasn't just air. She also tried to kill them by injecting them with insulin or by overfeeding them with milk. That's right. Two of the cases involved babies who she'd injected with insulin into feeding bags that went into their stomachs, which were actually the most clear-cut part of the case because the blood tests that came back showed an extremely high insulin level 
alongside a very low level of another hormone called C-peptide. And the normal reading for an insulin level on a blood test would be two to 300. But in the case of Letby's victims, it was around the 4,000 mark. That was for one of the babies. On another of the babies, the second, it was off the scale. It was unreadable. You, of course, were in court watching Let Be as this evidence was presented. Josh, what did you find out about her, about who Lucy Let Be is? We knew that she'd grown up in Hereford. She studied nursing at the University of Chester uh, and she'd started a placement as a student at the Countess of Chester in 2010. These were all very basic details of her life and even towards the end of the trial, and in fact, even now, there's still a a big searching question about who the real Lucy Letby is, because to some of her friends, even now, they say she is the last person on earth you would think to be a murderer. She just seems so innocent and wallflowerish and ordinary, really. Nothing stuck out to anyone who knew her on the neonatal unit. But she had a very active social life. She would go to Zumba classes. She had a two-night holiday to Ibiza, girls' holiday, towards the end of these crimes. She was an only child and she seemed very close to her parents. They were utterly devoted to her. I mean, when we were shown pictures from her bedroom and inside her home for the first time, that was a kind of an eye-opening moment in a way because it was slightly odd that she had all these teddy bears scattered on her bed, you know, given her age. Yeah, she, she, she seemed quite immature. Josh, do we know what Lucy Letby's motive was? The detectives who investigated Lucy Letby and her background for years are stumped um, about what her motive might have been. Um, I remember the police briefing that was a week before the start of the trial and they outlined to us the case for the very first time what was missing from their presentation was why and I asked well what was her motive do you know they said we don't know and the jury aren't going to be told anything about motive there were ideas that were floated by the prosecution during the trial you know, that she enjoyed the excitement of being involved in resuscitations. She was, in effect, playing God with babies' lives, even that she wanted attention from uh, a married doctor who she was supposedly having a relationship with, which she consistently denied. And it was just a huge question mark that hung over the trial and I think still does. Did you ever see Lucy Letby show emotion in the court? Yeah, we did see uh, Lucy Letby show emotion um, within minutes of starting her evidence, really, um, when she was being questioned by her defence barrister, Benjamin Myers, KC. Um, and she was asked about the impact that the arrest had had on her life um, and her career. You know, she started crying immediately. But throughout most of this 10-month trial, she just sat there looking completely blank and showing no emotion, staring straight ahead, completely unreadable. Letby's diaries were also presented in evidence against her. How significant were they in building the case against her? I mean, the first time that we saw Letby's diaries were when we were shown, on the fourth day of the trial, we were shown a post-it note that Letby had written um, after being removed from the neonatal unit in 2016. And on it were things like, I am evil, I did this, I killed them because I'm not good enough. And that was a, an absolutely shocking moment. It felt like a real indicator of guilt. But we weren't shown the full extent of her diaries until much later into the prosecution evidence, almost sort of eight months into the trial. You know, she, she wrote everything in her diary. She would, you know, the delivery of a washing machine was one of the things that she wrote down, I remember seeing. Yeah, as well as which babies she was caring for on which particular days. Social engagements were written in one colour and work stuff was written in another colour. She seemed very sort of fastidious to make a note of absolutely everything. 
Her house was full of paperwork as well, medical paperwork, just stuff that she didn't need to keep. And then when she was asked about this, she said, it's because I collect paperwork. I have a real difficulty throwing things out. And that sort of fastidious documenting that you've talked about in her diaries, I extended as well to her use of social media. And I wonder if you could tell us what the police discovered there about her searches and what she was looking at. When police searched through Letby's phone records, they were, they were stunned. I mean, she spent so much of her life on Facebook when, when she was at work. She was searching for around 250 people a month on Facebook or looking at their profiles. And these were strangers to her, you know, people who she came across in Zumba classes or in, in shops, who people who she just learned their names. And she also searched for the parents of the babies who were on the neonatal unit. And some of these were obviously the parents of her victims. And there was a real striking moment in the trial when the prosecution showed her phone records from times where she'd just clocked off shift and she'd immediately go home and start searching for the parents of babies that she'd harmed. Like she was checking up on them to see if they'd posted anything about their children and she'd search for them years later, you know, on days like Christmas Day as well or anniversaries of their deaths, presumably to see if they'd written anything about about their grief, about their loss. Josh, Lucy Letby joined the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England as a nurse in 2012. When did people first raise concerns about her? Her name first dropped into conversations about what happened to these babies in June 2015, when three babies had died within 14 days in really unexplained, unusual circumstances. So in an average year, three babies would die on this neonatal unit, and that's in one year. But in just two weeks, in June 2015, three babies died in really sudden and unusual circumstances. And when doctors looked into what happened to these babies, one of the common themes was that Lucy Letby had been on shift for each of them. At this time, it was felt to be purely coincidental. She was just thought of as unlucky to be on shift for each of them. What happened next? What happened in the intervening period? So after her name had been first mentioned in, in relation to these um, babies, doctors went away and, and, and looked at more at what had happened to them and tried to come up with some answers, but still they were, they were unexplained. And then months later, more babies started dying and, and collapsing. And again, another staffing review found that she was the only nurse on shift at the time. The concerns of, of doctors were escalated to the medical director of the hospital, who's effectively the number two at the hospital. Steve, firstly, are you all right to talk me through what your role was or is on, on the neonatal unit, head paediatric consultant? What does that mean? OK, so I was um, one of the seven general paediatricians in the hospital, but I, um, my role was uh, the neonatal lead clinician. Josh, you spoke to one doctor in particular, Dr Stephen Brary, who was a colleague of Letby's and the key whistleblower in this case. What did he say about that period? Yeah, I remember meeting Stephen in a cafe in Chester and we sat down. He was very nervous at first. Um, it was the first time he'd spoken um, to a journalist about any of this and you could tell he was anxious. He, um, you know, sat with his back to the rest of the cafe because he didn't want to be seen by anyone. He was quite paranoid because of what he and his other doctors had been through in trying to raise concerns about Letby. But what he explained to me, I mean, we had a four-hour conversation and it was one that I'll never forget. What he, he explained was how concerns had been raised multiple times over the course of almost a year about Lucy Letby. Your normal, rational, working with colleagues, senior colleagues in the NHS trying to you know, figure out a problem, turn to enough is enough. You know, we have to make this unit safe. And, um, you know, the only way I could see after that would be for her to leave the neonatal unit off clinical duties until, you know, it was investigated properly. There didn't seem to be a, another option that would sit well enough in my conscience. And that executives had effectively done 
very little in that time um, and they'd in fact defended her. It was a concern. Um, that concern wasn't shared by the neonatal unit manager. She felt the deaths were more multifactorial and that she didn't really believe that Lucy Letby um, could have committed any crime. Stephen told me that executives effectively treated the doctors as troublemakers. So the medical director, Ian Harvey, commissioned two reviews into these deaths. One was a, an overarching look at the management of the neonatal unit and how it was operating. The second was a closer look at the case notes for um, a number of these babies where the deaths or collapses were unascertained, where they didn't know why these babies had suddenly deteriorated. Each of these two reviews concluded that there were a number of deaths that needed further forensic investigation. But despite this, the medical director, Ian Harvey, and his chief executive, Tony Chambers, felt it was right for Letby to return to the unit. They felt that she'd been effectively cleared by these two reviews. And they held this extraordinary sounding meeting with senior doctors in January 2017, where they read out the bullet point top lines of these two reviews. It didn't mention anything about the fact they'd both called for further forensic investigations. Uh, Tony Chambers, the chief executive, said he'd spent hours speaking to Lucy Letby and her father, and they were adamant that she was innocent. He told the doctors that they were to draw a line under this matter, or there would be consequences. And you were to apologise to Lucy Letby? Absolutely, yeah. What was your response at that point? Uh, we were all stunned. It, it's still etched in everybody's minds. It's just the most horrific meeting. I'm ever likely to uh, attend. And the implication the doctors felt was that they would be either reprimanded or reported to the General Medical Council if they didn't cooperate and allow Lu Lucy Letby to return to the neonatal unit. Uh, we all felt obviously very intimidated and bullied into agreeing to their demands, which they're, what they're asking for. And I asked if... Um, we could see the reports, and Ian Harvey's original response was no, and the meeting finished. That, that, that was it, and then we went away reeling. So what happened after that extraordinary meeting, and it was clear to the doctors that Lucy had been exonerated by the management of the hospital? Well, after that meeting, the, the doctors all went away and were stunned and shocked and incredibly worried, and were trying to figure out what they could do to try and stop Lucy Letby to return into the unit. What was happening at the same time was Lucy Letby had started a grievance procedure of the way that the hospital had removed her from the neonatal unit. Um, and as part of that grievance procedure, two of these senior doctors, of which Stephen Brewery was one, were ordered to go to mediation with her, sit down and talk to her about their concerns. She would have the chance to respond in a formal kind of HR process. But then when Lucy Letby was days away from returning to the unit, the doctors were given the name of a Cheshire Constabulary police officer who they approached and told them about their concerns for the first time. This was at the end of April 2017. And they sat down with this detective who was a specialist in safeguarding and told him about the series of unexplained collapses and the concerns that one nurse, Lucy Letby, was found to be on shift for each of them. And he said, this is something that you've got to take to the police immediately, formally take it to the police. And so that's what happened days later. And then executives at the same time formally contacted the police who immediately launched their investigation in May 2017. Well, we should say that in a statement, Ian Harvey has blamed the doctors for failing to spot insulin records that showed two boys had been poisoned eight months apart. He said, these serious errors were never brought to my attention, either directly or through the Trust's incident reporting system. And Tony Chambers said that he took prompt action when he learned about doctors' concerns and moved Letby off the neonatal unit. But before the police were involved... The hospital was, of course, maintaining that Letby was not responsible for those deaths. 
So Josh, how did they explain the dramatic change in neonatal outcomes? And what was the hospital doing to prevent other cases of babies mysteriously collapsing or dying? In May 2016, a month before Letby was eventually removed from the neonatal unit, one of the managers conducted what was called an assurance review. And it said that many of the babies had congenital vulnerabilities, which meant that they were seriously ill. It even blamed other NHS services for their deaths. It blamed the transport service. It blamed another hospital for not having a a cot free at the time that one of these babies was seriously ill. Effectively, it blamed everything else except Lucy Letby. And that was their position in, in May 2016 after a number, a large number of these babies had died and and suffered unusual deaths. They effectively felt that it was an an unfortunate series of events had led to this extremely high mortality rate, which is really difficult to look at from the outside because you think three deaths in just 14 days is a year's worth of deaths. That surely is enough to set alarm bells ringing at an executive level right from that very point. And if you're an executive and looking at these unexplained deaths, you're trying your best to find out exactly what's happening. And looking at it now, because obviously many more babies still died and were harmed by Let Be after that, I mean, were there other key opportunities that were missed to stop her? In retrospect, there were multiple opportunities to stop Lucy Let Be during the course of this year, but one of the starkest, perhaps, is the insulin poisonings. The first insulin poisoning was on the 5th of August 2015. This is two months after the deaths of those three babies in 14 days. Um, Doctors were really confused about what was happening um, with this um, baby boy and his uh, blood sugar levels. And so they sent off for a blood test to be done. And that analysis was conducted at at another hospital. When those results came through, they weren't immediately noticed by the doctors as something that were was a cause for concern. They were read by a doctor who wasn't on shift when this baby boy had suddenly deteriorated, so they didn't necessarily know all the details of the case. These results were missed at the time, and they were missed again um, eight months later when the second baby was poisoned with insulin. Josh, from everything you've explained, it was a really complex case full of medical jargon, full of of scientific fact and research. And I wonder how much you know about how the police conducted their investigation and how they revealed all the things that had been picked up by the hospital's own internal reviews. When the police first started looking at this case, they decided to assign each baby an individual detective or two detectives and once the circumstances of these individual babies had been investigated they would figure out what the common themes were and there were common themes that ran through this whole year of Letby's crimes but what they had to do was send these results to medical experts because the police weren't qualified to analyse these uh, medical records for each baby so they commissioned medical experts, neonatologists with uh, decades of experience to analyse the results. Those results were cross-referenced by other experts who all came to the conclusion that these babies had been deliberately harmed. But this process, although fairly quick to explain, it actually takes months and years to do. It's so painstaking This investigation has grown from a team of, I think, 12 detectives in the early days in 2017 to now between 60 and 70 detectives currently working on this investigation. Um, They're based in their own building. They've got their own building in Chester that they work out of. These detectives are now looking at the records of more than 4,000 babies who were at hospitals where Letby worked between 2012 and 2016. The other hospital is Liverpool Women's Hospital, where she did two relatively short placements in 2012 and 2015. 
experts that were instructed by the police who I've spoken to have said they expect the police to find more evidence of other babies that she's harmed. But this investigation continues and it may result in further charges down the line. Has anyone else faced any censure? Has anyone else taken responsibility? Where do management lie in all of this now? No one else has faced any censure um, for this at all or or been reprimanded in any way. Um, All of the executives involved practically have left the Countess of Chester Hospital. Two of the key ones left within weeks of Letby's arrest in 2018. One of the executives involved um, who had moved to another NHS trust has recently been suspended after new evidence came to light about what she knew and her actions at the time. Josh, the government has ordered an inquiry following the Letby verdict. What will that be looking at and what questions will it need to answer? The most pressing question for this inquiry was how Lucy Letby was able to get away with committing these heinous crimes for as long as she did and whether anyone could have done any more to stop her. The families have been waiting for years for answers anyway. I don't think anyone wants this process to be rushed. They want these lessons to be learned properly. Josh, this is a really unusual harrowing case. It is the stuff of nightmares for parents. What does it tell us about the treatment of NHS staff when they raise concerns at work? This is the latest in a, in a long line of um, what Stephen Breary described as the culture of secrecy and denial in the NHS. Having spoken to colleagues in other hospitals, I don't think the behaviour of the executives in Chester actually is that unusual. And I think I could foresee something similar happening again. There have been multiple cases of consultants raising concerns about patient safety in the past and then being punished as a result of it and treated as troublemakers. And it seems to be a a culture thing in the NHS that needs to be looked at as part of this review and perhaps that will be one of the biggest overarching lessons that is to be learned from this independent inquiry. Well, there are now calls for systemic changes to prevent another case like Lucy Letby's ever occurring again. But Josh, what might those changes actually look like? There are supposed to be protections in place for staff who raise concerns. Doctors have a duty of care to raise concerns about patient safety, but it it feels sometimes like NHS management's priority is to protect their reputation. It's felt very uncomfortable for all of us having all these concerns and not being able to share them with parents. That feels like a huge cultural shift that will obviously take time. But other changes might be more immediate. The way that insulin results are reported, for example, perhaps those can be made more clear. Um, The way that insulin seems to be accessible to anyone with a key on these wards. What we heard during Lucy Letby's trial was that insulin was kept inside a locked cupboard um, in one of the rooms but that anyone who had this key at any point could access the insulin uh, without signing any records and that just doesn't feel right for a substance that can be incredibly harmful and is known to be incredibly harmful uh, especially in in such young children. I think another theme that will be drawn from the inquiry is about staffing like practically every clinical department in the, in the NHS, this neonatal unit was understaffed and overworked. It consistently fell below the national guidelines on, on staff to patient ratios. The nurses and doctors were looking after too many babies each. But what this understaffing means is that when things go wrong, seriously wrong, either through deliberate harm or negligence, it, these issues aren't picked up as quickly. 